the Holy Gospel is written in the 16th chapter of the Holy Gospel according to St. John beginning to read at verse 16. Glory to Christ our Savior. St. John's Gospel chapter 16 and verse 16. A little while and you will see me no longer and again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me and because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying what does this mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him so he said to them, Is this what you are asking? What I mean by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you see me? Truly, truly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. When a woman is given birth, she has sorrow because her hours come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now. But I'll see you again. And you will hear and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy from you. That day you will ask nothing of me. To literally I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you've asked nothing in money. Ask and you receive that your joy may be full. Grant to our God that the truth of your word may nourish our hearts and be for us the bread of life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please sit. The fulfillment of Jesus going to the Father has been revealed. So in the anguish of the crucifixion as the disciples saw it, together with all those who followed, the apostles and co, those three days for them was the worst of days and the longest. <coughs> but after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and they saw him and they touched him, their wish as, we, as, as it is ours is that he should never go away again. Because if he does, the trouble that's waiting for us, who will help us? God knows that. And Jesus gives the assurance to all who would have faith in him and believe in him. He knows that. And he assures them that unless he goes to the Father, they will not see him again. Now in human Understanding how possible is that? How will we see him again? How? He shouldn't go anywhere. We prefer him physically present so that those miracles that he does, he will do them for us all the time. The raising of the dead, being with us in our times of struggles and troubles on the sea and everywhere else, casting out demons. We need Him with us. And God knows that those who believe Him will need Him. There's no other way if you truly believe in Jesus Christ without needing Him. Because without Him, we can do nothing. But He gives us the assurance that there's a need for a departure. Because when he goes, 
he no longer will be restricted to Galilee in travels on foot. He will no longer be restricted to Capernaum on foot. He will no longer be restricted to Jerusalem on foot. He will no longer be available for those killers to kill him again. He's now going to the Father. And the Holy Spirit will come in his person. His ascension is the assurance that he has now filled the whole world in the hearts of all who believe in him or in the congregations where he is worshipped and glorified. He's now available in India, in America, in Japan, in Nigeria, in Africa, anywhere else at the same time. That is why God is omnipotent, omniscience, and omnipresent. His ascension assures us that God is truly God. He is. Paul captures it in Ephesians chapter 4. And he's talking to people in Ephesus where the goddess Artemis was worshipped where drunkenness and fornication were part of a normal life, where idol worship was paramount. In fact, historians said that the temple of Artemis was one of the seven wonders of the world at that time, and people came for pilgrimages to buy the pendants and the charms of the goddess Artemis. And you recall in Acts of the Apostles, a huge uproar happened when Paul preached in that city. Because he confronted these powerful demons that have governmental support. These powerful businessmen who were wealthy and were sponsors of all kinds of riots and all kinds of alcoholism, homosexuality, drunkenness, and all kinds of perverseness in the world. They exported it from Ephesus and Paul preached and the people turned to Christ. Miracles happened. Because Jesus had ascended, he released the Holy Spirit. Paul himself was converted and encountered Jesus Christ. He carried the gospel to the highest point of paganism. And people turned to Christ. This brings to question some of the Christian practices that we have in Nigeria that exposes our weaknesses. I've been talking about our weaknesses for quite a bit now. And here is another one. When a pastor is posted to a place, he goes looking for Christians who are Anglicans. He doesn't go looking for those who are not Christians. That shows how weak your faith is. When you are in the university, you look for fellow brethren. It only exposes how weak and ineffective the Christian gospel you claim is. Paul descends on Ephesus in a pagan city and people turn to Christ. In fact, it was in Ephesus that Epaphras became a Christian and took the gospel to Colossae. Any gospel that is completely hinged on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, on the ascension of Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit is power. Paul says it in Romans chapter 1, he says, the gospel is the power of God. When the missionaries, CMS missionaries came to our homeland, there was not a single Christian. They evangelized. They preached the gospel and they became Christians. Why? The ascended Jesus, who was powerful on earth, is still the same powerful Jesus who is sitting at the right hand of God. And has released the power of the Holy Spirit to all who believe, who go anywhere, who go anywhere, and you will see and experience the power of God. Paul who understands this encourages the Christians in Ephesus who are now the new nucleus of the church 
And he says to them, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. There is something deposited in you when you received Christ. There is a need for the evidence that you have received Christ. There are some ingredients that make people want to know why you do what you do unlike everybody else. There is a worth in your salvation. Unless if it is worthless. If it has a worth, there is. And Paul insists that the way in which you walk in a godless society will compel people to ask. It will. The madman at Gerasenet or Gennesaret, the villagers came and they saw that he was normal. And they wondered. And he says, I want to follow you, Jesus. He said, no, go down to your home people. And they know him very well. Now they saw a different person. A different family situation. A different way of raising children. A different way of farming. A different way of doing business. A different way of teaching students. A different way of being students. A different way of lifestyle. A different way of church. People will ask. Work worthy of that call and here are the ingredients of that worthiness humility verse 2 gentleness patience bearing the ability to bear with one another we all have different journeys on earth I've been converted 43 years now 44 there are people who are converted today and yet we have to sit together. We must bear and understand because I'm coming from a background too that once upon a time I was like that. Don't expect everybody to grow up suddenly like you. You do that and how do you do it? You do it in love. The key absent ingredient in most of our churches is the absence of, the absence of love. We blast our spiritual gifts but there's a missing link. Love is not there. Even when we dish out rules, and the rules in Nigeria are all about women. I don't know where they got that from. It is only women who must not this, women must not the other women. And they say it without love. So the women are feeling intimidated. <laughs> Every little boy now who is flying his shirt anywhere feels better than a woman who has not covered her hair. And we say it without love. I don't know where you got that Christianity from. It kills the ingredient. And most of it are traditional regulations from our cultures that we impose in the church. It's not here in the gospel, at least in most places that I see. Because whatever else you're going to do, if you remove love, your call diminishes. And the reason Paul says that is because we are accountable to one God if we have the one faith. If we're all baptized, and as Anglicans we insist if we're confirmed, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So we do this not for our own sake, not because we want a comfortable church so that everybody looks alike. Not because we come from the same tribe. No, we do this because there is only one God. Father of all. And we want to maintain this body of Christ that contains Europeans, Americans, Indians and everybody. We do it all under Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Walking worthy of a manner of our calling, denouncing sin, rejecting wickedness, standing for truth, upholding the word of God, baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of love. Why should we do that? My brother-in-law is an architect. He's been an architect now for close to 40 years, I think. Everybody knows him all over Andamawa. 
a very senior architect. And now, in fact, they now know him all over the country. Because if he's supervising a building, the first place he goes when he's supervising a building, he will pick a block from where you are. When he picks it, and he's a huge man. In fact, his nickname is Man Plus. He's a huge man. When he picks the block, and he shakes it like this, then he will throw it. If it breaks, every single structure is coming down. Oh, people don't like him. <laughs> people don't like him. If you are given a contract and they say, Man Plus is your supervisor, they say, to your, your block has to be correct. In fact, when he came to Zambini, he picked one of the blocks and threw it. He picked another one again, randomly, and threw it. He said, okay, nobody is good. People can build with it. <laughs> That's what God is doing here. God wants to build his church. And if you are not, if you are not, if your cement is not correct, the building will collapse. In fact, if your cement is not correct, if the Indian ingredient of your calling, if the ingredient of your calling, the evidence of your calling is not correct, you yourself will not build anything. It will collapse. I keep saying the weakness of our Christianity is the weakness of the ingredient that makes our block and we carry color and say we are Christians. We are not building anything that will last. It will collapse. We must build according to the word of God. If we don't do it, what Jesus said will not happen. Because he said, in the world, you will have sorrow. Okay? But be of good cheer, I have overcome. In this case, it is you who cannot overcome. It's not the fault of Jesus. If you build correctly, Jesus will overcome. Because you cannot build outside of Jesus. You must need him. You must walk a holy life. You must live a righteous life. You must live a life full of love. With humility. With patience. All the ingredients of building a life that is a block. Which God can use for the building up of the saints. You become part of that building. And you can fit in your own line of the building. If your line of the building is a weak block, it will collapse. Think about that. Let us pray. Lord, help us to build. Help us to build ourselves in your word. By the Holy Spirit. Lord, release upon us the Holy Spirit that we may be solidly grounded in your word. In holiness and truth. With justice and righteousness and love. With all humility. Lord, build us up. So that we being built up may build your body. Grant this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.